Good morning. Welcome to God's house for our worship this morning. First of all, as it's been in the news and we've heard public health warnings and things of that nature and by our very limited attendance at our services this week, you can tell that the flu has struck the members of our church as well. Um, so this week and next week, uh, we'll just be a little more careful in our greeting. Uh, I, I will not shake hands uh, when you go out. Please don't be offended. I just don't want to pass germs from this person to that person to that person. Um, and then as we greet each other at the end, just, just this week and next week, just say hello. Uh, we can still get up and around, um, but a, a hello is, is as good as a handshake. So um, again, just recognizing and being mindful of those. Uh, we, we, we do have a number of our people who have been sick over the last couple of weeks. Um, and there are a lot of people in our community as well. Our order of service is printed for us in the service folder that we received when you came in. It is the service of word also in the hymnal. You know, the choir will sing our psalm for today. Let's begin with our opening hymn number 283 in the hymnal, Speak, O Savior, I am listening. <laughs> Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children, but we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins and plead for His mercy. 
Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. From the mouth of God to our hearts, our Lord speaks to us His word. The first reading is from the book of Jonah, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell him. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh just as the word of the Lord had commanded him. Had commanded. Now Nineveh was a great city to God. It required a three-day walk. Jonah walked through the city for a day. And he called out 40 more days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. The men of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil way, God relented from the disaster which he said he would bring on them, and he did not carry it out. This is the word of the Lord.
second reading is from Acts chapter 13. Now in the church at Antioch, there were some prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger. Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them off. So they were sent out by the Holy Spirit and went down to Seleucia. From there they sailed to Cyprus, and when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, also the sermon text for the week. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The time is fulfilled, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the gospel. As Jesus was going along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat mending the nets. Immediately Jesus called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. seated. The hymn of the day is number 85 in the hymnal. O God from God, O light from light.
May the words that I speak, dear Lord, and all the thoughts of our hearts and our minds be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Of course, on many occasions in my life, I have been asked regarding my allegiance to certain professional and collegiate sports teams. Sometimes I question my own allegiance to such teams as well. Yes, I've been a fan of the team who has gone 0 16 and not the Browns either, because that would be worse. Or the baseball team that has the first 106 lose losses season in like 50 some years. People wonder, why? Why would I do something so foolish? And then I tell them the answer. I always tell them, well, in order to cheer for a team like that, you have to be a real fan. Same question can be asked of our following Jesus. Why? Those who ask it might say the same. Why do something so foolish? It's an important question for us to ask. For those who follow him, why do we follow Jesus? As Jesus gathers his first disciples to himself in our gospel, we see some details which help us to understand why Jesus' disciples follow Jesus. Here we have Andrew and John. We know that they had been disciples of St. John the Baptist. Andrew's brother Peter, John's brother James, likely the same. They had at least been around John the Baptist. And we heard what happened to John the Baptist, didn't we? He's out of the picture now. John had all been but disposed of by Herod. He had not yet been beheaded, but he was in prison. So now what are those who had followed John as his disciples now going to do? Well, they followed Jesus. And we know that they already followed Jesus before Jesus called them here at the Sea of Galilee. Because one day they were with John out in the wilderness. And Jesus came and John said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, this is the guy that I was telling you about. He's the one greater than me. I can't even tie his shoes. Now it's time for me to go away. So Jesus' disciples follow him because they can't follow John anymore. Yeah, but Jesus isn't just like some second choice. Well, John's in prison. I guess we'll go to the next guy. No, they follow Jesus because they see that there is something about him that he is for them the only one there is no one else like this Jesus they have come to see and to believe him to be the Messiah the one sent by God now I think we struggle to understand how big of a deal this was. The people of God had waited for generation after generation after generation. I'm talking thousands of years for this Messiah to come. And now look at what Jesus says. The time is now fulfilled. There is no one else but Jesus for them to follow because he is the one sent by God as Messiah. Think about how big of a deal this is now for them as they see Jesus as no ordinary teacher or prophet or, or rabbi, but as the Messiah of God here in this person is fulfilled. Every promise that God has made to his people Jesus is the seed of the woman, the one promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He is the Lion of Judah, the desire of nation. He is David's son. He is the Lord, our righteousness. There is no other one like him. And 
And so they follow him and they find more reason. What sets him apart? Like none other. It's the message he brings. Sent by God. The time is now. The promises of God are fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. You heard the word, right? He preached the gospel and he said, believe the gospel. This is great news. That's what the word gospel means. We know that. This is great news that he brings and this is why they follow him because he has such great news. Now, what kind of news would Jesus have that these men would consider to be so great that they would follow him now, right? It would be great news if Jesus had said, follow me, I am going to provide for you a life that is going to be way more lucrative than fishing for a living. That would be great news. It would be great news for them as Jewish people. If Jesus would say, yes, I have come, I am the kingdom of God, I am going to raise up the nation of Israel, I will destroy the heathen nation that is over you, that would be great news too. And it would be great news for them. If Jesus would be the one who is going to bring all those irreligious Jews back to a moral and upright people again. Well, that would be great news, wouldn't it? And all good reason to follow Jesus too, but that's not the news he brings. We follow him too. Why? Great news. That's why Jesus' followers follow him. He's got great news. What would be... It would be great news for us. It would be great news, wouldn't it? If we had Jesus give us every answer to every problem that we have in our lives. That would be great news. It would be great news when we have the monumental decisions to make in our life. Move here, take that job, whatever it might be. Marry this person. And Jesus would just whisper in our ear because if he made the choice, we know it couldn't be wrong. Like my decisions often are. That would be great news, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be, be great news, wouldn't it? If Jesus would be the one that would get the debt collectors off my back. It would be great news if Jesus would be the one who would come here and, and, and fix this, this world, this culture in which we live, right? It would be great news if Jesus would just come and, and, and blow pornography off the map out of our culture or that he would come and fix our government because that obviously can't work, right? Or it would be great news if, if he would get mom and dad to stop fighting and husband and wife to stop cheating on each other. Yes, that would all be great news. And, and I would follow him if he did just one of these things. But that's not the great news that he brings. So then why do we follow him? Because there is, there's no one like him. None of the greatest that have ever walked the face of this earth are like him. None of the greatest philosophers or, or thinkers or religious leaders are like him. He is the one sent by God. The fulfillment of every word of God and promise that he has made to his people. He is Messiah. He is true God himself. There is none like Jesus. Confucius couldn't say this. Buddha, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, Billy Graham, they all have lots of followers. But they're not like him. Sent by God as Messiah. To look at him now in his epiphany as he reveals himself to us again and again. What do you see? Who do you see in him? You see God. You look at the face of Christ and you see a friendly face and you see a friendly face that is God himself. And he comes with this message because now is the time that God is doing this. And look at the message he brings. Repent. So what do we know? What has he come to do when you hear repent? He's come to deal with sin. 
That's great news. There is none like him. Because none can do for us and be for us what he is for us and what he will do for us in fulfillment of every promise that God has made to his people. To be saved, there must be no sin. None. God sends him to be the Lord, our righteousness. To be what we can never be. To give to us what we can never earn for ourselves. To be saved, God must be tendered a huge price. So God made him to be the lamb without blemish and defect. The one who is stricken, smitten, and afflicted and crucified. To pay a price we could never pay up on the cross for our sins. To be saved. Hell's fury must be endured and punished. God gave Jesus to us who cried out himself, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And dying the hell that we deserve for our sin. Jesus is a great teacher. Surely he's compassionate and caring. And yes, he heals and provides. But this is not why we follow him. We follow him because God has made him to be our Savior. And there is none other. And now we think how easy is it? How easy that this is Jesus for me. It's so easy to follow him, isn't it? If I were there at the Sea of Galilee, I too would have dropped everything. I would have left my nets behind. I would have left my dad behind too. I would have left my life behind in order to follow him. But now just think for a moment about the characters that God uses and Jesus calls. They're fishermen. There are the likes of Jonah and St. Paul. As ordinary as we are. Do they deserve that they be the ones called to follow and that they be entrusted with the work that God has? No, they don't deserve it. Nor do we deserve the opportunity to follow. But as he did for them, so he does the same to us. He says to these men, I will make you fishers of men. They fished for a living, right? And now their whole life is going to change. They're not going to be fishing for fish. They're going to be fishing for men. And that's what happens when you follow Jesus. He changes everything. But now look as he calls them to follow he doesn't say to them, this is how your life is going to change. This is how your life is going to transform. It's going to be easy. It's going to be luxurious. And you're going to have everything. He doesn't say that. You're going to be fishers of men. Sign me up for that. Your life is going to change. He changes your life. And in a remarkable way. When we follow, it's not a matter of following to get from point A to point B, from destination to place. It's not like we leave church and say, now you're going to follow me in order to get to the restaurant the right way. When Jesus says, follow me, he says it in a way that when you follow him, it's like a path to be sure, but it never ends. It, it keeps on going because we know where it is. We follow him because he changes 
everything for us. And look at the remarkable changes that he makes. Not just a change from being fishermen to fishers of men, but what is he doing in that? He is bringing those who follow him to be united with him in heart and mind and want the same thing. For what is it to be fishers of men? But then to share what we know about Jesus with others without excuse. To realize what he's done for me is not just for me, but for all. To see that he chooses to use us to carry out his precious work. Look at how he changes us. And we realize as we look at how ordinary these men, how much we don't deserve that we have this privilege to follow. What discipleship is really, truly all about. Discipleship is not what I bring now that I follow, like Jesus is better off now that I'm following him. But discipleship is discipleship. Truly that. It is teaching. It is learning. It is following. It is growing. And so this is what we can count on our relationship with him to be. As he teaches and speaks and we learn and listen and grow. He tells us what he has done. He gives us what he has done himself. He tells us what we do. And how we do this in our life following him. Look at that. Immediately, they, they left their nets, they left their father, they put everything behind because they realized there is nothing going to stand in my way. Not from following this one because there is none like him. I'm not going to play this game in my life where, where I, I want to have this and I want to have that. I want to do this and I want to do that. This is everything for us. Because we know Everything for us depends on him. I read a journal, journal article this week from a man, a Christian man, who has had depression most of his adult life. And he is a very devout Christian, going to church every week, his whole life. He realized that in his battle with depression, he didn't understand what it meant to be a follower and a disciple of Jesus. He thought being a disciple was more about what he was doing than about what Jesus was doing. And he realized that his relationship with his church was also causing a major problem for him that led him to this understanding. So when he had depression, he got to that lowest point, he brought this up at his church. And so they told him, all you need is Jesus. And he thought to himself, I've already found Jesus. And yet I still feel awful. They said to him, people who know Jesus don't walk around feeling sorry for themselves. And he thought, I can't help it. Well, maybe I don't really know Jesus. Maybe I am going to hell. And they told him, don't go to the psychologist, don't go to the psychiatrist. All the medicine you need is right there in the Bible. Just take his promises for yourself and you'll be fine. And he thought, I must not be doing it right. Or I must not have found that right passage for me. He was told depression is because of sin in your life. You have to repent. And he thought to himself, I do. I repent all the time for everything. Even when I'm pretty sure that I've not done anything wrong. And finally God blessed him to realize that his following Jesus was not about what he was doing or what he was. But it was about the one he found. And what Jesus had done for him. And who Jesus was. Why do you follow Jesus? Because he is for you what no one else or nothing else could ever be. The Savior sent by God. 
He does for you what no one else, not even yourself, could ever do. He changes everything for you. Why do you follow Jesus? Because there is no one else. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. One who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. With one heart and voice, let us confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus our Lord and for all according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your son once called Andrew and Peter, James and John to follow him with a promise that he would make them fishers of men. Grant your baptized the faith so to hear and heed the Savior's call that through following Christ the Holy Spirit would draw many into the Savior's net and rescue them from everlasting destruction. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you are high above all nations, and your glory is above the heavens. Look in mercy on our nation. Give to those entrusted with civil authority courage and compassion, wisdom and integrity. Raise up men and women who will speak your warning threat of judgment to our nation, just as you raised up Jonah, your servant, to warn Nineveh. Give our nation the grace of repentance to turn from evil. We beg your protection, especially for those most vulnerable among us, particularly those in the womb. Free us from all willful blindness and disregard of your precious gift of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your Son came proclaiming the gospel of your kingdom and inviting all to repentance and faith, so prosper the preaching of Christ in our land and in every place throughout the world. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may your name be praised. We especially commend to you those who have left home and kindred to proclaim the good news in foreign lands. Strengthen them in the tasks at hand and supply their daily bread. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are afflicted or suffering in any way. Stretch forth the right hand of your majesty to heal and defend them in your own chosen time and manner, giving them faith to trust your wise governance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, you have given your Son to raise us from the dust of death and seat us with princes in the new heavens and the new earth. 
Receive our thanks for all your servants who have died, looking forward with eager expectation to that joyous day. When our last hour comes, support us by your power and receive us into your everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Our next hymn is printed in the service folder, O Christ who called the twelve. and your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
be seated. Our closing hymn also printed in the service folder, Lord, help us on your servant way. <laughs> 